Gamers. It is I, the Prophet Shillup, the Nostradamus of gaming news, here with more prescient predictions of the future. Are you ready? Here we go. Nomura will make another Kingdom Hearts game, and the plot will make no sense. Ubisoft will release an open world video game, and it will have microtransactions and NFTs, and it will suck. Hideo Kojima. Sony will buy Konami's IP and all of Capcom. Nintendo will always be weird. If you doubt any of my predictions, obviously you missed my tweet where I 100% accurately predicted Sony buying Bungie. So you guys thought I was trying to be funny with my Sony down bad late night booty call DM, but I was really showing you a vision of the future and you just weren't ready for it. That is right, ladies and gentlemen, it's news so big that we don't even have time for an intro block today. Sony, makers of the Walkman, the Discman, and the PlayStation Man have purchased Bungie for the princely sum of $3.6 billion. I was asleep when the news broke. I awoke to find my phone melting under the weight of the mentions. And when I began to process what was going on, my first immediate thought was, thank you, Jim Ryan, for dropping this news the day before this week in video games goes live. That's a little more courteous than some people we know. It's okay, Phil, I still love you. Call me. Okay, so let's talk about the details of this news first because it's a really, really weird deal. Like, the most weird purchase I've ever seen in all of the video game industry, for real. So it is confirmed that Sony are outright buying Bungie for $3.6 billion. That means that they own the studio itself, and unless there's some funky legal language in there that we don't know about, Sony now owns all of Bungie's current IP so Destiny, and all of its future IP, such as the as yet unrevealed live service multiplayer game that Bungie are currently developing, plus apparently some other stuff as well. So if you are an Xbox or a PC player, then your first thought's gonna be, oh shit, Destiny is gonna become a PlayStation exclusive. Well, fear not, because as I said, this deal is weird. Right out of the gates, Bungie confirmed that Destiny will remain a multi-platform game, meaning it will still be available on Xbox, PC, and for the three people playing it on Stadia. Big relief for them. Bungie also went on to say that this move will not affect any of their plans for Destiny's content right through to the Final Shape expansion, which is due to ship sometime in 2024. They also confirmed that there will not be any PlayStation exclusive content in the Witch Queen expansion, which is good news, but it also kind of implies that there probably will be some PlayStation exclusive content in future expansions, which kind of sucks because the whole platform exclusive weapon strikes and PvP maps thing really blew. Not keen to see that return. What's even weirder though is this one line from the Q&A that Bungie self-published. Quote, Question, Bungie has future games in development. Will they now become PlayStation exclusives? Answer, no. We want the worlds we are creating to extend to anywhere people play games. We will continue to be self-published, creatively independent, and we will continue to drive one unified Bungie community, end quote. That means the future of Bungie games are all but guaranteed to be multi-platform. But do be careful of the language. Just because they promise it to be multi-platform doesn't mean they promise it to be on all platforms. To be fair, I think this quote probably does indicate a future on Xbox. That's certainly how I read it. But with how heated the upcoming content wars will become, I don't think we should take anything for granted. As they say, all's fair in love and console wars. It's clear from the wording of these announcements, as well as interviews with Bungie CEO Pete Parsons, that Bungie fought hard for the terms of this deal. They were bought once before by Microsoft, and when they sought creative freedom beyond Halo, they were denied it. They signed a Faustian bargain with Activision, which gave them reach and resources, but stopped them from making the game they wanted to make. In securing their independence some years back, Bungie was emphatic that they would never sign it away again. The terms of this deal make Bungie an independent subsidiary of Sony. They were not absorbed into it the way that Insomniac or Bluepoint were. Bungie will continue to self-publish their games, and they claim they will retain full creative control over what they make. I don't know what sort of legal language supports that claim. Like, I'm sure it's true, but I just don't know the tripwires that have been put down to enforce that kind of thing, because typically when you buy something, it's yours and you can boss it around. This almost sounds like a partnership more than an acquisition, and it's staggering to think that Bungie could have negotiated these terms with Sony, a platform holder and one of the largest entertainment conglomerates on the planet. So why did Sony make all these concessions and decide to buy Bungie for nearly half the price that Microsoft paid for all of Bethesda? 
So firstly, this is not a clap back at Microsoft for the purchase of Activision Blizzard. Believe it or not, spending $3.6 billion to buy something is complex and it takes time. It took Phil two months or more of wheeling and dealing to land Activision Blizzard. And the word on the street is that Sony and Bungie have been doing this dance for over six months now. By the way, I didn't know about any of this when I did my sassy little tweet. I was literally just shit posting. It's like that Apollo meme. And today I got hit with the big red ball. Anyway, so if Sony aren't clapping back, then what are they doing? Well, think about Sony. What's it good at? Single player, narrative driven action games that are typically exclusive to their consoles. They're amazing at that stuff, by the way. They absolutely crushed Xbox last generation on the back of that. But it's a new day now and the sands are ever shifting. And so Sony can't rest on those laurels. So what don't they have then? Well, they don't have any first person shooters. They had Killzone, lol, and not a single tear was shed when that went the way of the dodo. They don't have live service games. They don't have games that are microtransaction driven. They don't have competitive multiplayer games. They don't have a strong presence on PC, though admittedly that is improving recently with the release of a number of PC ports like Horizon, Days Gone, and God of War. So there are some big gaps in Sony's portfolio and Bungie is like tailor-made to fit those gaps. Alongside Call of Duty's developers, they are the most successful first-person shooter developer of all time. They have a wildly successful live service video game on their hands, and they've gone through so much learning to get to the point where they're at now with their content cadence and quality level. While Destiny's PvP kind of sucks, competitive multiplayer is baked deep into Bungie's DNA. These are the people that made Halo 2, for God's sake. And Bungie are truly multi-platform with a very strong and consistently growing PC presence. So yeah, all of that clicks really nicely into Sony's portfolio. I was joking when I tweeted that thing, but I, it was also based on something because I can think of few better studios for Sony to purchase than this one. Very few studios could provide the same uplift to Sony that Bungie can. A lot of that uplift is predicated on potential. Bungie are working on new games, including a competitive live service multiplayer shooter, at least that's the rumor. That could suck or it could be amazing. There's also the potential to leverage the Destiny IP and other IPs in the TV and movie space. I mean, Destiny is so, so ripe for that. And Sony own a movie studio. They can make that happen now. And if handled correctly, that has the potential to be huge. This still isn't just about potential. Potential though, I think it very much reflects Bungie's premium position in the market today based on the product they are currently putting out. For a long time now, I've been trying to tell everyone that Destiny is extraordinary. It's not just a little bit good, it's not a lot good, it's the best good. It is peerless in its genre. It has the best shooting mechanics of any video game ever made. It has the most intoxicating power fantasy of any live service video game on the market right now. It is a genuine evolution of the MMORPG genre, condensing its most appealing elements into a format that can be enjoyed by people who don't have the time to invest in traditional MMOs. It has some of the best art design across all of video games, some of the best music, its world is pretty rad, and the storytelling has improved leaps and bounds over the last 12 months in particular. So I've been trying to say all this stuff for a long time, and everyone's like, no, Destiny sucks. Well, here's $3.6 billion worth of proof that it doesn't. Oh, but Bungie sucks. Yes, I actually kind of agree with you on that, at least when it comes to the commercial stuff. Bungie's developers are so, so talented, but as I've said many times before, this studio has categorically failed to build a good reputation in the market for the way it treats its customers. The sunsetting, the exclusive deals, the deleting of content people paid for, the Eververse and the fucking transmog system. These things all suck to varying degrees. And for a while now, I've been saying that the biggest thing holding back Destiny isn't the game, it's Bungie and its relationship to its customers past, present, and potential. That begs the question, will all of that change with Sony now underwriting them? I don't know. I mean, I feel like we went through all of this with the Activision split some years back. I think we were all hopeful that a lot of the commercial bullshit would be improved by virtue of that split, but I don't think it was. I think we got a better game in many aspects, deeper, more complex, more MMO-like, but we also traded away a bunch of content that we paid for because Bungie said they no longer had the resources to support it. So that was a real double-edged sword. So am I happy about this deal? Not really, but I'm not unhappy about it. I just think there's so much we don't know or don't understand about this weird deal, and it's kind of impossible to come to any specific conclusions. It definitely folds into what is, I think, an overall negative trend, which is industry consolidation. 
more content and IP being owned by fewer and fewer companies. It's a rapidly accelerating trend, and I don't think it's good for the industry overall, but it does feel rather inevitable, and this deal is just a reminder of that fact. There will be more to say on this topic over the coming weeks and months, but for now, let's talk about some completely unrelated news that has nothing to do with Bungie. The Halo TV show. Did you guys see that trailer they put out? Uh, amazing. We got uh, the Chief, we got the Covenant, we got Pelicans, we got Spartans, we... What, what the fuck is this? This is Cortana? What is wrong with her? This is like the Sonic movie all over again. What is it with Hollywood and blue characters? Just make it look like it looks in the video games and we'll all be happy, okay? For real though, I gotta say, I'm a little conflicted with this trailer. It's a lot. I don't know, I just hope this isn't some overly produced explosion fest since the lore of the Halo universe is pretty damn cool and it would be a shame if that wasn't properly explored. Having said that, the showrunners have kind of said that they're going their own way with this one so I don't even know if they're going to respect the existing lore at all. That is a question for March 24th when that show premieres on that streaming platform that no one is subscribed to. Do they do like a seven day free trial? Because I feel like that's the way I'm going to be doing this one. You might not know this, but before Halo was a TV show, Halo was actually a video game. True story. Halo Infinite's multiplayer continues to receive updates at pace, with recent changes to the store making things a little cheaper and more accessible for everyone, and even the promise of being able to earn some of those sweet, sweet premium currency credits in the future. Content-wise, there's always been the plan for new maps and modes to be added, but if recent rumors are to be believed, then Master Chief and his fellow Spartans might soon be wading into the big wide world of Battle Royale. It's long been rumored that Halo Infinite would at some point get a Battle Royale mode, but Jez Corden of Windows Central claims that a new multiplayer mode is being developed and that it could be the Battle Royale. Interestingly, this new mode is not being made by 343, it's being outsourced to Certain Affinity, the studio that has provided support to a number of AAA games in the past, including Halo Infinite. Now, this is an unconfirmed rumor, so we have to take it with a grain of salt, but it does make sense. Back when I was reviewing Halo, I was actually chatting with a senior Ubisoft developer who spent his whole life making first-person shooters, and we were chatting about Zeta Halo's map design, and he was like, dude, that map is tailor-made for Battle Royale. And I'm like, oh yeah, I can totally see that. Probably needs a few more landmarks to spice things up, but the topography is certainly there. I would love it if Halo went down this path because I think it would be a great fit. I mean, the ODST unit basically invented the whole where we dropping boys thing, so it would be nice to see things come full circle. While we're on the topic of certain affinity, they probably aren't working on just this Halo multiplayer mode. Jeff Grubb of VentureBeat was speaking on his Grub Snacks podcast, and he revealed that the same studio is also working on a Monster Hunter style co-op game. Jez Corden would then go on to say that his sources have confirmed this for him as well, and that the game is currently being developed under the codename Swerte, which as Dictionary.com tells me is, quote, an action or pass performed by a bullfighter, end quote. So yes, that actually fits quite well for a Monster Hunter style game. Corden says that the title has been in development since 2020, will likely be revealed in 2023, and will ship in 2024, so we've got quite a wait ahead for us. One very short wait is the wait for Elden Ring, which ships on the 25th of this month. Can you believe it? Roughly 35 years after its initial reveal, Elden Ring will soon be in our grubby, Dorito dust-covered gamer hands. To start building some hype for the title, because you know, there's not a lot of hype out there for this one, we got some fresh insights from Soul series creator and guy daydreaming about all the ways poison swamps can kill people, Hidetaka Miyazaki. In an interview posted to the PlayStation blog, Miyazaki offered up his own thoughts on the recurring difficulty debate, where he said that while Elden Ring isn't necessarily easier, he does think more people will complete it. Quote, this time in Elden Ring, we have many options at the player's disposal to confront challenging situations and use their cunning to outsmart enemies and bosses. They can come back to something later when they're at an impasse, so they can have this freedom of progression and not have to bang their heads against a wall over and over. They can figure out what to do and how to approach it again at their own pace." End quote. This very much mirrors my own experience with the game when I was previewing it, where I noticed that the number of choices you have as a player is vastly expanded here. So while the challenge itself remains pretty constant, the ability to approach it in different ways made it the most accessible FromSoft game I'd ever played. Anyway, that's out at the end of the month. I could not be more pumped for this. It's the last big release in what is the most stacked February in the history of video games. So while I will be exhausted from having played and reviewed Dying Light 2, and Oli Oli World, and Sifu, and Horizon Forbidden West, and maybe some Lost Ark. I'm gonna keep some fuel in the tank for this one. And then I'm gonna play Witch Queen for like, six weeks. Man, when am I gonna sleep?
Anyway, here's some sad news. After more than 50 years in the arcade business, Sega has sold the last of its Japanese arcades. It's the end of an era as video games got their global jump start in these noisy quarter field halls. But with home PCs and gaming consoles and now smartphones being totally ubiquitous, everyone's basically carrying around an arcade in their pocket. The coup de grace came in the form of COVID, which took aim at an already unsteady industry and knocked it for six. That's a cricket reference, by the way. Sega was hoping to weather the storm, but when Omicron came along, they just cashed out completely, selling the remainder of their arcades to a company called Genda. Ironically, the name of the law firm that Yagami works at in Sega's Judgment series. I wonder if that's just a coincidence. We've got some news we probably weren't supposed to get about a new Mortal Kombat game. Recently, a senior producer at NetherRealm Studios tweeted out an image that I won't show here since Warner Brothers might copy strike my channel, but the image itself wasn't very exciting. It was just some old Mortal Kombat art strewn on a desk. What was more exciting was that on the monitor nearby, in tiny little font, were the words MK12 underscore mast, which is probably a file associated with Mortal Kombat 12. Toasty! The producer quickly deleted that tweet, leading some to suspect that he either made a mistake or that it was a purposeful leak designed to build some hype. I'm sure we're going to find out soon enough since it's been over three years since NetherRealm's last release and we're due for another. Alright, let's talk about Ubisoft for a while. Last week, Ubisoft announced that there weren't going to be any more updates for Watch Dogs Legion. Fair enough, I say. They made a game. It probably wasn't meant to live forever. They're moving on. All good. A few days later, though, Ubisoft announced that their fledgling battle royale game Hyperscape was uh, going to live on a farm so it can play with all the other battle royale games and be really happy there forever. Right, Dad? That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Less than two years after Hyperscape made its sudden and surprising reveal, Ubisoft is shutting the game down entirely. Because it is a server-based game, you will not be able to play it by any means, and I don't believe they're doing any refunds for people who purchase any of the skins or whatever, so that's just a sunk cost for those people, which really sucks. So look, I'm bummed about this because I kind of like this game. I reviewed it at launch, and there were definitely plenty of problems with it, but it was also a really fresh take on Battle Royale, and it also was resurrecting a style of play that I really like, the Unreal Tournament version of Arena Shooting. When this news broke, a lot of people were like, oh, classic trend-chasing Ubisoft with another lazy copy-and-paste game. But that just wasn't true. There were plenty of other Battle Royale games on the market, but none like this one. This was unique. Ubisoft tried to do something good here. Unlike all the shit they're doing with NFTs, which brings us to our favorite weekly segment, no fucking thanks. This week, Ubisoft went full Joss Whedon, deciding that the best way to recover from a disastrous collapse in public sentiment was to do an interview where they just call everybody else stupid and then make things way worse. The interview was with Ubisoft's Vice President of Strategic Innovation, Nicholas Puid, as well as Didier Genevois, Ubisoft's blockchain technical developer. The interview appeared on Finder.com, an Australian website that helps you compare prices for like car insurance and shit. Oh, and they also have a section devoted to cryptocurrency sales, so no conflict of interest there. Anyway, this interview is a fucking doozy. When asked about their response to the negativity surrounding NFTs in games, Puid says that we, the gamers, are just too fucking dumb to understand that he's actually doing us a favor. Quote, well, it was a reaction we were expecting. We know it's not an easy concept to grasp, but Quartz is really just a first step that should lead to something bigger, something that will be more easily understood by our players. That's the way we think about it and why we will keep experimenting. We will keep releasing features and services around this initiative. And our belief is that piece by piece, the puzzle will be revealed and understood by our players. We hope they will better understand the value we offer them, end quote. Newsflash, Purid, we fucking get it, dude. Everybody does. It's not hard. No matter how much NFT bros try to make it seem like this futurist, esoteric, 4D chess evolution of ownership, it's just a fucking scam designed to get dumb people buying stuff that doesn't exist and that holds value in only the pyramid scheme in which it's all encased. He were going to talk about what really motivates Ubisoft is players truly owning what they purchase. Quote, the end game is about giving players the opportunity to resell their items once they're finished with them or they're finished playing the game itself. So it's really for them. It's really beneficial, but they don't get it for now. End quote. What a fucking asshole. Here's the thing though, right? When asked about the idea of selling games themselves as NFTs, so you can like resell the games in your digital library, 
Pruitt responds by saying, quote, that's part of the use case we can explore, but it's not the focus today, end quote. How convenient. The one thing that might be useful to us isn't on the table. Funny that. Oh, and by the way, you don't even need NFTs to support a secondhand digital games market. But this quote was just proof positive that these companies don't give a shit about you truly owning things, otherwise they'd let you resell your games. This is all just an excuse for them to sell you more shitty skins and digital items, nothing more. It's interesting to see how far companies will go to push this in the face of universal hatred from gamers. Recently, Riot put out some art for one of their in-game characters called Killjoy. The art depicted Killjoy in an art game gallery looking at a picture which it turned out was an NFT by an NFT artist Martin Hura. So vehement was the backlash against the very idea that Killjoy was into NFTs that Riot took down the image and apologized for posting it. That is how hated NFTs are. Even make-believe video game characters get cancelled for expressing the slightest interest in them. Good. Among the many, many reasons that NFTs are so hated is the fact that many of them are just based on straight up theft, either by stealing art or through rug pulls where projects pre-sell a bunch of NFTs and then suddenly vanish when it comes time to deliver on those projects. I mean, just this week alone, Nintendo shut down an NFT project which was using their IP. The game would award people NFTs for completing Mario levels. Nintendo's lawyers are the most highly trained in the entire legal profession. Nobody gets more of a workout than these people do. So yeah, they very quickly shut that down. Another project was based on Minecraft and they sold over $1.2 million worth of promised NFTs before suddenly deleting their website, their Discord and everything else. Later they would say they were just so upset about all the harassment they were getting so they had to delete all traces of their enterprise and scrub any links connecting them to the project. They promised that they're definitely going to deliver they just need a little more time. They also expressed a willingness to hand over the project to someone else to deliver, so long as they can keep all the money priceless. To cap all of this off, we welcome to center stage the zombified corpse of Atari. Do you recall that this is not the actual Atari that we used to like? It's instead this propped up venture capital thing designed to milk Atari's IP in unpleasant ways. Case in point, this week Atari had the brilliant idea of combining our two favorite things in their new product offering. Loot box NFTs. Those are two words you never want to hear together, like explosive herpes or Pete Molyneux. The NFTs are a blind purchase that will unwrap at a later date. And the more you purchase, the more you're allowed to purchase. It's like a new spin on the classic buy one, get one free deal, only this time it's buy one, buy more. The NFTs are being made in collaboration with a company called Republic Realm, whose CEO Jan Yorio described the NFTs as, quote, like Hallmark cards for the next generation, a more exciting, meaningful gift than either a greeting card or a gift certificate, end quote. So this Valentine's Day, you could go to the trouble of writing your girl a beautiful, heartfelt Valentine's Day card expressing your love and appreciation and devotion to her, or you could give the gift that every girl really wants, Atari NFTs the hallmark card for the next generation of dudes who will never get laid because they're giving their girl a fucking NFT. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, first up, the PC version of the director's cut version of Kojimbo's latest opus got a release date, March 30th. This new version adds new missions, new weapons, and new gadgets, including the cargo catapult. There were concerns that this one would be an epic exclusive, but luckily Tim's money seems to hold no sway over Kojima, so Steam stands will enjoy this one on day one. They announced a new Walking Dead game. Just what this world needs, more Walking Dead stuff. To be fair though, this newly announced title is the sequel to 2020's Walking Dead Saints and Sinners, one of the most critically acclaimed VR titles on the market today. The sequel will be a continuation of the story told in the first game with the same protagonist returning. Given its development window, there's a good bet that this one will end up on not only current PC VR platforms, but also the PSVR 2, which should be hitting sometime in the next 12 months, 18 months, two years max. Last week, Warner Brothers issued a confirmation that the highly anticipated Hogwarts Legacy was still on track for a 2022 release date. Well, they're back at it again, confirming this week that Gotham Knights is also still on track for a release this year. 
The news comes directly from the CEO of Warner Media himself, who tweeted about it, so that makes the confirmation a little less solid. I mean, it's not like this dude is out there playtesting dev builds and track and Jira points. Still, it's something, and given how little we've heard about this title since its announcement, we'll take what we can get. The final release date announcement is one that breaks my sunburned heart. The Steam Deck is confirmed to be shipping in select territories commencing February 25th. And wouldn't you know it, Australia is not one of those territories. This is one of those rare moments where we reach across the Tasman Sea and join our New Zealand brethren in commiseration, for they too are deckless, despite Gaben taking up residence over there in Bag End. If the country that plays host to Gaben can't even get a look in, what chance do we have here in Australia? Oh well, at least we'll be getting the play date soon. It may not be able to play God of War or anything, but it does have a crank. I'm not sure why, but I'm really into that. There were two delay announcements this week. The first was for upcoming wrestling battle royale game Rumbleverse. Yes, you heard that right. They are making a wrestling battle royale game, and I think that sounds awesome. What's less awesome is the fact that the game was supposed to release on February 8th, but has been delayed indefinitely, and people who pre-purchase the game are getting full refunds. That chain of events typically leads to a game disappearing forever, but there is cause for optimism since another beta test is going live in February, and I don't think they'd go to all that trouble if they were planning on being the game anytime soon. You can sign up for that beta through the Epic Client, it'll be live on February 12th. Finally, the upcoming multiplayer Evil Dead game got a delay. This was meant to ship in March, but has now been pushed back to the 13th of May, with the developers saying they needed more time to polish the game. I think that's a lie. I reckon the real reason is that May 13th is the first Friday the 13th of the year, and they want to launch it on that auspicious date. Fair enough, I say. So what came out last week? Well, it was basically just ports and remasters this week with one notable exception, Pokemon Arceus. We discussed it briefly last week when reviews were very hot off the presses, but with even more outlets issuing their verdict on the title, I thought it'd be interesting to do a quick whip around to see where the consensus has landed. So if we look at Open Critic, Arceus has done very well for itself. An aggregate score of around 84, putting it at mighty, and Metacritic has recorded a grand total of zero negative reviews for it. Video Game Chronicle gushed about this one, scoring at a perfect 100, saying, quote, It may not have been apparent from the trailers, but this is one of the most entertaining, engaging, and engrossing games in the entire history of the Pokemon series, and is highly recommended to both longtime fans and complete newcomers, end quote. Game Informer gave a sterling endorsement as well with a score of 88, quote, Pokemon Legends Arceus charts an exciting new direction for the series, while still maintaining many of the core tenets that made Game Freak's franchise so beloved in the first place, end quote. Surprisingly, it was IGN of all outlets who put out the most critical review, scoring it a 70 and saying, quote, Pokemon Legends Arceus is an ambitious revamp that successfully revolutionizes the defining Pokemon experiences of catching and battling, but is unfortunately set in a drab, empty, and at times tedious world, end quote. What I've heard from people playing it is that they love it, and while the opening section is apparently a little shit and the graphics are complete fucking ass, it really is the update to the formula that Pokemon fans were hoping for. Now, if Game Freak can just be bothered to create art assets that don't look like they're pulled from a dollar store asset library, then the next Pokemon game might be pretty special indeed. So, what's coming out this week? Well, it's a very quiet week with one notable exception. We'll get to that one last, you know, build some suspense, increase some watch time, you know how it is. First up is the Life is Strange Remastered Collection arriving on all platforms but the Switch today. The bundle contains both Life is Strange 1 and 2, with improved visuals and animations supported by motion capture, so that's nice. These games have never been my jam, but a bunch of people really like them, so hopefully this is a nice facelift that fans will appreciate. The Waylanders is a classically inspired CRPG that's been in early access since 2020. It's hitting 1.0 tomorrow, exclusive to the PC. This one is sitting at around 70% mostly positive, so hopefully the finishing touches inherent in any 1.0 build will bump that score up a little. The big release for the week is, of course, Dying Light 2. In development for over six years at Techland and suffering no small amount of drama and delays during that period, the parkour-infused, zombie-infested, open-world action game hits all platforms but the Switch on the 4th. The Switch port, by the way, is delayed by up to six months. No exact word on that yet. I have played and finished this bad boy, all 500 hours of it. I'm joking, I spent far less than that, but I did sink many hours into it. I'm currently under embargo, so I'm not allowed to say anything, even though everyone else on social media seems to be saying all of this stuff already. I'm gonna be a good boy, I'm gonna play by the rules and put my review out on Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Sydney time. As always, don't worry about time conversion. It's so annoying, it sucks. Just hit the subscribe button, 
ding the notification bell and you'll know the minute that review goes live. That's gonna be a big one, you're not gonna wanna miss it. Put this on your radar. Recently, I put a call out on Twitter for indie developers looking for some help to put a spotlight on their work, and this little gem came back, Jupiter Moon's Mecha. As you can see from the trailer, this is very much the deck builder roguelike that's become all the rage since the arrival of Slay the Spire, but that's okay. I found this subgenre of games has maintained a pretty consistent level of quality, as each new entry seems to borrow and combine the best elements of the games that preceded it. This one, I just really like the aesthetic. Most of the time these deck builders are in creepy dungeon settings, so it's nice to see it looking like a 1980s Hasbro cartoon. The unique twist here is that in addition to your deck, you're also able to modify your mech, and I just dig the whole first person cockpit perspective as well. Jupiter Moons is currently in development, there is no release date yet, but there is a demo up if you'd like to check it out for yourself. I'll leave a link to the Steam page below. Please do wishlist this one if you're interested as that does help out the developers in a big way. Sort of free stuff time and we are at the beginning of the month which means that there's a lot of ground to cover. We already knew the PS Plus lineup for the month, UFC, Planet Coaster and Borderlands 2 DLC sort of. Not exactly a sterling lineup until you compare it to this month's Xbox Games with Gold. Seems like Microsoft spent all their money buying Activision Blizzard and have none left over to give away some decent games. This month, Xbox fans can look forward to the disappointment of Band of Bugs and Hydrophobia for the Xbox 360. For the Xbox One, there's Aerial Knight's Never Yield, which is one of those 2D runners. I actually played this one and I did not like it. Finally, there's Broken Sword 5, which to be fair, is a beloved game and a beloved franchise, but this one was released back in 2014, so it's certainly getting on in its years now. Epic are having a pretty decent week. Right now, you can grab the mech combat RPG Damon X Machina, and later in the week, that'll tick over to Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. The sort of sequel to the 3D platformer that was released back in 2017, the Impossible Lair changes up the format significantly by dropping down to a 2D perspective, but none of the quality or charm is lost in that transition. We're still awaiting news on the February Game Pass lineup at the moment, but do remember that Total War Warhammer 3 is arriving on day one for Game Pass on PC. That'll be on the 17th of February, certainly looking forward to the Mandalore review for that one. Finally, Twitch Prime is coming in a lot lighter this month than it's been for the last while, where before we had bangers like Jedi Fallen Order, Need for Speed and Frostpunk, this month's lineup is a lot more muted. The headline offering is a game that was already free to play, Lost Ark, the upcoming ARPG MMO hybrid. This one has plenty of hype behind it as it's been available in other territories for a long ass time and everyone here in the West has been begging to see it published here. That will happen on February 11th when the game goes into a full release with Twitch Prime subscribers getting some exclusive in-game goodies. But like I said, the game is free to play for all so you don't need Twitch Prime to play it. Outside of that, Uncle Jeff is serving up 4x strategy game Stellaris, Grayscale survival game Ashwalkers, roguelike resource management sim As Far As The Eye, and 2D rhythm based side scroller Double Kick Heroes. This one looks pretty cool actually. Guys, we are running so, so long in this episode owing to the last minute inclusion of that huge bungo news. So our feel good story for the week is that someone made steamed hams into a point and click adventure game and it's the best thing ever. It's already my game of the year. Take a look. Superintendent, I hope you're ready for mouth-watering hamburgers. I thought we were having steamed clams. No, oh, no, I said steamed hams. That's what I call hamburgers. You call hamburgers steamed hams? Yes. This reminds me of that other ambitious steamed hams video game project. Steamed hams, but it's Metal Gear Solid. Well, Seymour, I made it, despite your directions. Ah, Superintendent Chalmers, welcome. I hope you're prepared for an unforgettable luncheon. Yeah. I don't understand why this scene is so funny and how it stays funny forever, but it does. Ladies and gentlemen, what an episode. Easily our longest yet. I thank you for sticking around. I thank Austin for editing it. Uh, if you are still here and you enjoyed what you saw, then uh, it'd be great if you could smack the like button for me. It is a huge help for me, especially on videos that run this long. If you want to come back for more, be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding that notification bell. This week is the Dying Light 2 review and then Sifu, and then next week is even more stuff which I won't spoil. But you don't want to miss it, so come back soon now you're here. Alright, shell up out. <laughs>